Minister. And now I call on Deputy Luke Flanagan. You have 30 minutes. <coughs> Okay, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I was going to start off on something different, but uh, given that you have gone into the whole area of uh, oil exploration and gas exploration, uh, I just want to say that uh, this morning I spoke to uh, Eddie Hobbs on the phone about his uh, book, Own Our Oil, and uh, he seems to be uh, quite convinced uh, about what he's saying, uh, in that uh, he do doesn't think that uh, the government or successive governments have done a good job on this issue. Now, time will tell whether he's right or not, or whether you're right or not. But what I have done is I have written to the Joint Oireachtas Committee, I think the letter has gone off in the last half hour, uh, asking that uh, those people who were involved in writing that book uh, be allowed to come into the committee and discuss the whole issue. Because, look, at, uh, people can talk about conspiracy theories or whatever they want, but I would hope that you'd want the best deal for Ireland, and I'd imagine you do. So the best way to do that is that we bring everyone in and talk to everyone who has a legitimate opinion on it. And I know when you go to the doorsteps and you talk to people, this is an area of frustration and we always hear back well it isn't quite that simple and there, we haven't found anything yet and we're not losing hundreds of millions but I think we need to nail this debate once and for all and I'm just wondering would you too maybe uh, ask that uh, these people who wrote this book, Eddie Hobbs and I understand about 14 other people, into that committee and get this issue debated. Because if we can do it better, um, uh, well then that is good for us all. Now, many speakers who have come in here have said that uh, the government had a bit of a cheek to uh, close down the doll for uh, a week and a half uh, in order to do a lap of honour. Well, actually, I would say that uh, you were very brave to come in here and uh, actually try and defend what you've done over the last three years, because uh, bar cochlear implants, uh, I can't really think of anything positive. Um, when it comes to the whole area of health, one area that's really standing out now as a problem is the whole area of midwifery. And the fact that in some of our uh, maternity hospitals, we have a situation where our midwives have to work twice as hard as what the international standard suggests. 29.5 births per midwife. We now have a situation where we have 55 in some hospitals. That no matter what anyone says to try and defend that, it's not going to come up to the mark. Now, when I seen um, he's, he, he wasn't a minister and he wasn't a politician at the time, when I seen the now Minister Riley come on television years ago and say he was thinking of getting involved in politics, I put my hands up and say I was very hopeful from what I heard him say. And given that he had a doctor's background and he knew what he was on about, I thought maybe we might see some positive changes. But the facts are, it's too late to, uh, now to be blaming Fianna Fáil. It's three years you've been in government, and we have a situation where how can it be safe, as safe as it should be, if midwives have to work twice as hard as what the international standard suggests? Now, I remember in advance of the election uh, in a radio interview, and Deputy Frank Feehan and the now Senator um, John Kelly was in the radio interview, involved in the whole debate in the run-up to the election. And I actually said that uh, I agreed with quite a few of Fine Gael's policies, but my only concern was that Fine Gael didn't believe in them themselves. And as it turns out, that is true. And in particular, when it comes to Roscommon A&E, I actually agreed with Fine Gael's policy on that, and the promise by Andy Kenny while standing up on a soapbox in Roscommon Town in the square, where he told us that he would keep our A&E open. And then subsequently, after closing it, within the cock had barely crown, he had it closed, and his argument was, well, you know, he was sorry for the confusion, and maybe he didn't explain himself well enough. Oh, he explained himself well enough, all right. People voted for him on the basis. Martin Kenny from Sinn Féin would be a TD in here now. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that is a fact. If Enda Kenny had told people in Roscommon Town that day when he made the promise, if he had told them what he's saying to us now. And then he came along, 
and hid behind supposed confusion and actually said that HICWA recommended it to be closed down. HICWA recommended no such thing. That is not true. Then we had Minister Riley come along and say it's because of the dire uh, coronary uh, uh, care problems in there and people, uh, higher rates of people who went in there with uh, cardiac problems dying. He completely manipulated the, uh, the statistics on that, wasn't comparing like with like, wasn't allowing for the fact that there was an older population and older people going into Roscommon Hospital, but no, he hid behind it. So really, how on earth can people in Roscommon be happy with the performance of this government? Now, another person who kind of convinced me, maybe I'm a little bit gullible, um, in the first few months uh, in here, we had a private member's motion, the technical group, and to be quite honest, I didn't even know what a private member's motion was up until I discovered I was the one who was going to be helping uh, put it together. And we come in here, Maureen O'Sullivan, uh, Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan and Deputy Stephen Donnelly, and we said our piece. And we made the point that on mental health, we weren't going to make a political football out of it because it was too important to make a political football out of it. And that we would leave it to Minister Lynch, we'd give her a year, maybe give her two years to see what had happened. Well, this is what has happened. What has happened is we now have a situation, and these are not my words, and let no one accuse me be irresponsible for telling the truth. We have clinicians who describe the mental hospital, the psychiatric unit in Galway as Dickensian. The, what was going on there was described as bedlam. These are clinicians who work in there, and I hate having to say this because people are going to have to go and use that service, and you don't want to scare them away, but you've got to deal with the facts. Deal with the facts that three years into government, we had patients lying in wet beds because there was water coming through the roof. We have a situation where patients are shivering in corridors waiting for one of the three showers 31 people to use three showers now it's kind of interesting last week in the doll here deputy frank fian stood up and suggested that maybe i should go in and look at the hospitals and see the great work that's going on now he was referring to roscommon hospital in fairness to him but i did make an attempt to go in and see the psychiatric hospital in galway along with deputy dennis nocton along with deputy colin keevney and with uh, senator michael mullen we were not allowed in and we were told it was because of patient confidentiality, which would have been legitimate if there was anyone in the ward. There was no one in the ward. So on one hand, we're told to shut us up. Oh, why don't you come in and see the great work we're doing? Then we'll go in and try and see it. We're not late. So if we have to go back to the public then and say, well, actually, we're not allowed to go in and see are the conditions as was described by the clinicians, what's going to happen? People are not going to trust the service. Sorry, can I get a drink of water, please? Um, uh, people are not going to trust the service. And we were told excluded from going in there that, no, you've got it wrong. There's actually five showers. Now, it's like the way some people might treat a child. It's actually more money than it really is. Well, no, it isn't. We're not stupid. We don't believe what you're telling us because you won't let us see it. We're also told that it was only a minor leak, when in fact we know that there is the equivalent of a duck pond on the roof of that unit held up by RSJs which are covered up uh, with some sort of material to hide that fact. We were told, no, that is not the case. It is the case. It is a fact. And as someone who, and many people in this country have, who suffer from mental health problems in the past, and no doubt in the future, the black dog will be back to visit, it terrifies me, the idea that if you got sick, this would be your only option. But I have to tell you, my biggest fear in the past of mental health illness was that I'd have to use the services. Well, that fear has not been alleviated, not in the slightest. Now, we have, or we had rather, a brilliant system going in Banlaslow where we had 22 beds in St. Bridget's, which was working well. It was a model for how Vision for Change should work. And what happens? You dismantle it. When the local community tried to stop, you dismantle it. The Gardaí were called parents 
of clients of that service, clients of that service fighting quite literally with their hands to try and hold on to that service. But no, we had a vote in the Shannon on it, and someone like Senator Lorraine Higgins, who's meant to represent people in Ballinasloe, she betrayed them, she voted to close it. And you know what her comeback to me when I hit her about it on Twitter was, oh, well, you never got your swimming pool open all year round. Now, hold on a minute here. We're talking about people sleeping in wet beds, shivering in corridors, and the best we can get from the senator, who shouldn't have that job anyways, is, oh, well, na 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 na, -na you didn't get your swimming pool done. We're talking about people talking about killing her themselves here and all we get is a lame political comeback that is a complete and utter failure on your part when it comes to health it's been a miserable failure now I'm sure people are sick of it at this stage but you will have to say it again Labour's way or Frankfurt's way when it comes to our banking debt well actually not our banking debt the bank's debt that we took on our shoulders we now have, as, as a result of your cowardice, an inability to even ask. We've got 70 billion euros on our shoulders for the future. My kids' future and their kids' future. And it is leeching money out of their prospects and their friends' prospects. Now, amazingly, uh, I heard Jim Higgins, MEP, on a local radio station, Shannon Side Radio, in the last week say that, well, actually, there's good news on the way. Before the next general election, now I thought it was hearing things because I checked it afterwards and no one else seemed to have this information, before the next general election, we are going to see retrospective recapitalization of the banks and we get the money back. Now, I thought I'd missed something, and I checked it out. No one else seemed to be saying this. So we still have a government who, on one hand, claims they have a victory and that we're doing all right. And on the other hand, we have an MEP trying to get re-elected who comes on the radio and says, oh, don't worry about it. This money is coming back to us. The way you're going about it, it will never come back to us. Now, all we are asking for is fairness. We joined the European Union when it was a community, and a community is meant to look after its people and its members. And whatever about people saying, oh, well, they've cut off our money supply and they'll do this to us or that to us if we demand a debt write down, the core issue here is the principle of the community. Does a community do that to you when you're in on hard times? Do they threaten to kick you when you're down? They shouldn't, and they did. And whatever about the detail on the money, the facts are there. It's no longer a community. It's a bully boy club ran by France and Germany under the guise of, well, we'll all go to war if we don't have this union anymore. It's not our fault they went to war, and it's not our, we shouldn't have to pay the price now for it down the line. Now, when it comes to write-downs, the government does understand the whole concept of a write-down. If you are a bugle or you are a company such as independent news and media and you get tens of millions of euros of write-down, we have a situation in AIB which we own 99.9% .9 or whatever in and we made the decision of we either give the money to INM and the Dennis O'Briens of the world, or we give debt write down on mortgages for people who are struggling to live, who are being tortured by the banks. What decision did we make? We made the decision to give it to the multi-millionaire, and then we'll go off and we'll thank him for paying Ireland's soccer manager's salary. Well, guess what? We're giving that man 10 times more out of one of our banks alone than he's paying a manager Oh, well, he couldn't even win last night, but anyways. Now, in relation to uh, farming and the common agricultural policy, I have to say Minister Coveney did the rich farmers proud and his own family members proud as well, and many of the government's family members proud, the ones on the 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 euros single farm payment. Now, the common agricul agricultural policy does not exist to pay back the loans in Bulgaria and Spain of houses that rich farmers bought here during the boom. That money was meant to keep 
small farms going, to keep families on farms, to create employment in farming, and most importantly, to guarantee food security for Europe. Now all it's guaranteeing is rich farmers' houses out in Bulgaria and Spain. Now, George Lee was talking about this at one stage, but he's gone very quiet on it now all of a sudden. I wonder why. I'd love to hear him talk up on it again, because billions leaving this country that should stay in our local communities is overused word, but it is a disgrace. Because remember, the small farmer, no more than the rich farmer, only needs to sleep in one bed, only eats one dinner, only buys, needs one pair of socks a day, etc. And the same with the rich farmer. But the poor farmer spends all of that money locally, but what the rich farmer does is he spreads it all around the world by the looks of things. This money should have gone to local communities. We have an organisation called the IFA who will defend this. What I say here and now is, members of the IFA, it's time you woke up and realised whose side this organisation is on. And the next time you go to a mart, refuse to pay that bloody levy, because you are paying a levy to fund an organisation that is screwing you more than Alan Shatter would have if he got his way to some of the whistleblowers. It is not on. This money was for farming communities. It's going to ranchers. It's going to the Larry Goodmans of the world, and that is completely and utterly wrong. Now, another policy that I agreed with of this incoming government was that they would stand by turf cutters. And as John O'Mahony said at a public meeting on February the 15th, 2011, in Mayo, he said under Fine Gael, turf cutting would be allowed in 2011. Well, guess what happened? I went out and cut my turf, as did Michael Fitzmaurice and many other turf cutters, and what happened? We were attacked. We were accused of being, quote-unquote, bad citizens. Bad citizens for doing what the government, incoming government, said they'd be all right with us doing. Changed their mind afterwards. Oh, we never realised how difficult it was going to be dealing with Europe. So you didn't understand how difficult it was going to be with Europe over turf cutting. You didn't understand the hospital situation. You didn't understand uh, the whole debt situation and how complicated it would be. So I suppose we can only conclude that come the next general election, when you put together your policies and you make the promises, we can only conclude that, well, actually, God love you, you don't understand what you're saying, so we better not vote for you. Now, at this stage, turf cutters are being dragged through, through the courts and we are listening to rubbish from the minister telling us that the problem is solved. Well, this morning, in his own answer, it was quite clear that the problem is not solved. You do not solve the problem by dealing with 15% of the people and excluding the rest and then pretending to the media, or only delighted to gobble it up, that the problem is solved. The problem is not solved, and the problem will only be solved when you listen to the stakeholders, and when you do listen to them, you take on board what they say, because at the moment you're listening to them and then you are ignoring them. And this problem will not go away until you start working with the people. We had a plan which was voted on here, everyone agreed with it, and I was carried out shoulder high out of the doll. What a great day, eh? And all that was going through my head was, how do I tell these people they're going to shaft them in a couple of months' time? I tried to, but they kept cheering because they thought the problem was solved. Well, it is not solved. We even had a situation where our Taoiseach, Enda Kenny, in a phone call to the head of the turf cutters, described him as a true patriot. So he's gone from being a true patriot now to being a criminal. It all depends on the audience, doesn't it? You're a true patriot if he's talking to you. You're a criminal if he's talking to another audience. Now, there's a big distance between those two explanations of that human being. I actually agree with Enda Kenny's first uh, analysis. Michael Fitzmaurice is a true patriot. Because who else would have travelled the country night after night, paying for his own diesel and his own chips along the way, looking for funding for no one, visited every bog that was necessary, put together a plan, and we presented it here. But what has happened? 
All that has happened is betrayal, twisting the truth, trying to spin things to make them sound good. But you look at the public knows the truth. And while you can close our a &E, and there isn't an awful lot I can do, I can't go in and kick in the door and pretend I'm a doctor and run it. And while you can close down our local schools and our post offices, fine, other than protest and disagree, there's not a lot I can do in opposition. But the great thing about the turf issue is, if you try and close my bog, and if it takes me going in there with my bare hands to pull it out, you won't be able to stop me. And you won't be able to stop the thousands of others who will do that. And that's why this issue is one that's going to nail ye in the end. Now, we heard a lot about local government reform before uh, this government came in. And there was documents thrown around the place with loads of uh, information in them about this happening and that happening. Well, yesterday, I got on to uh, the Department of the Environment and had about an hour-long chat with uh, someone there about how this system is going to work. Now, I had a good understanding of how it's going to work. I debated the topic in here, but I just wanted to hear what would happen if someone contacted the department and asked, how will this work? As things currently stand, we have now moved from a situation in Roscommon where we've gone from 26 down to 18 councillors. And other than that change, all that has happened is you have called the three areas something. You're calling them municipalities. Now I asked at the department, what legal requirement is there to hold any of those meetings? Are they, is there an onus on the chairman to call these meetings or whatever? And I was told that, well, look, strictly speaking, if no meetings were held, there'd be nothing that could be done. A bit kind of similar to when I was on the corporate policy group on Roscommon County Council, and we had a mayor that was looking for favours. We only got one meeting during that year. And guess what? There was nothing we could do about it. So are we facing a situation now where local government reform will be a bit like Windscale changing its name to Sellafield? The local area meetings and the roads meetings are now going to be called municipality meetings, and then we'll all meet anyways in a main council meeting where we'll have less influence than we used to, because apparently it's gone down a little bit more local. And what has changed? We were told about a, a structure, three regions that would take in various counties and that system would feed into that. That hasn't been readied yet. That hasn't been prepared. So in reality, we haven't had reform of local government. Now, there is this idea that you're bringing it closer to people, bringing local government closer to people. Now, how is local government being brought closer to the people of Boyle when you closed their town council? Now, I know they didn't have much power, and there wasn't an awful lot they could do with the minimal power that they had. But the answer there was not to get rid of it. The answer was to reform it and make it better, and to suggest that the meetings now being held in Roscommon is bringing local government closer. I suggest you watch the episode of Sesame Street where Grover explains to people what near and far is. You will notice that when someone is far away, they're a little bit smaller, and when they're closer, they're bigger. Because I seriously think that the minister doesn't understand the difference between near and far if he can close down local councils and call that bringing local government closer to us. Now, the benefits of reforming local government and giving councillors real power is so important, especially when it comes to business and when it comes to rates. And at the moment, and under the, the new system, there will really be nothing that councillors can seriously do to reduce rates without cutting services, that is. And these are the options that will be presented to councillors. But the job of rooting out money being wasted, that will not happen. Because councillors who do that get punished, as I did and a couple of other councillors on Roscommon County Council, Michael Mulligan, Sinn Féin councillor, another one. You cannot be the person who watches the pennies and also the person who wants to get stuff done in their area at the same time. Until we reform that system to put the elected representative in the driving seat, we will not see rates come down unless it means reducing services. 
When I was mayor, I've said this in here a few times, but it, it is definitely worth repeating, I was told by the head of finance, or the director of finance, that if I look for any more detail on the budget, he would leave the room. Now, the new system that's coming along, he'll still be able to leave the room and there'll be nothing you can do about it. And the rates won't come down. So, it's a shame you didn't change that. Given that, you claim that you care about creating jobs. Because if you cared about creating jobs, you would have done something about that. Now, the big issue that is hitting E at the moment, and it should be hitting E at the moment, is the whole issue of the way the Garda whistleblower has been treated. Both of them. Whether that be Sergeant McCabe or whether that be former Garda Wilson. Well, today, the Irish public in Mullingar at half past six will have an opportunity to come out and support these brave, brave people who are, do, who are trying to do a, a job, a tough job, but it's been made more difficult by the minister and more difficult by their boss, Mr. Callanan, who described them as disgusting. Now, this evening at half six, people in this country will have an opportunity to show how, in fact, these people are the opposite. They are wonderful people. They are brave people. But unfortunately, in this country, when you blow the whistle, the authorities don't look up. What they do is they look for a way to ram it down your throat. And if it doesn't choke you, they pray it will poison you when it gets to your stomach. That is exactly what we're dealing with. Now, it isn't the only cover-up that's going on. We have so many cases that are coming to us at this stage, whether it be Deputy Collins's office, Deputy Wallace, or Deputy Daly's, or my own, that we are under massive pressure trying to deal with them. New stories every day, astonishing stories that when you look into them, actually turn out to be true. But sadly, one of those cases, the death of Shane Toohey, their father contacted me today to tell me that they have been answered by Minister Shatter to tell them that they can't do anything for them. Now, anyone who would read the details of Shane Toohey's death, now, you wouldn't want to be Inspector Cluzo or Colombo or Jessica Fletcher to solve this one, but still the minister can't see anything wrong. Nothing to see here. Now, when he was in opposition, he was all gung-ho about doing something about this, and in particular the case of Father Niall Malloy. But at this stage, he's gone cold on it. It just doesn't suit him anymore. So these people must go on and suffer. Well, a message for you, Minister Shatter. We will not be giving up. We will keep at this until finally we break through. We have been given a glimmer of hope by the last few weeks by the fact that this issue has been covered and dealt with, and we will keep at it until we win. Because if we don't win, the children of this country will have to work with a Garda Siakana that unfortunately they will not be able to trust. And that is really, really sad. Now, one issue that I have brought up here over and over again over the last year and a half or so is the issue of Quilcha and the fact that I have had people come to me about alleged fraud against Quilcha. The deputy's two minutes remaining. Now, Minister Coveney, initially when I brought it up, said, well, I hadn't heard about it up until now. Well, if he'd followed the question I asked of Minister Shatter, he would have. But then when he did hear about it, well, what did he do? Well, he met with the company that came to us about the problem in the first place. Well, sorry, he didn't. His officials did. He couldn't meet us. He was too busy. And we met them again, and we met them again. And they did an investigation into it. So they called it an investigation that we weren't allowed to see, we weren't given a copy of, and guess what? The department couldn't get access to the information that they were looking for from Queenshire because it was commercially sensitive. Now, the minister is Queenshire's boss. Now, if he wants to carry out an investigation through the Department of Agriculture into, into alleged fraud against a company that we owned, how can he hide behind the excuse that it's commercially sensitive when in fact he could have got that information and judged what was happening on that information, but he refused to do so. 
Now, this government were very good and they were right to remind us and remind us on numerous occasions about the money that was wasted on the e-voting machines and 50 million and 60 million and whatever figure came to the head. Well, the figure I am talking about here in the alleged fraud against Gwilche, which we all own, is in the region of 85 million euros. Now, I'll pretend I'm Michal Martin for a second and maybe the media might listen. 85 million euros has been robbed of us and nothing is being done. It is making our forestry industry less competitive. It is in danger of putting many sawmillers on their knees and out of work. Do something about it. Try and do something right, will you? Thank you uh, very much, Deputy.